Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I am Mauricio Villacres, Chile Programs and Strategic Partnerships Manager at the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to our annual Tech Talk. Uh, I'm super excited. This is our first in-person program for the, um, the year. Um, before we start today's program, I have a few details to share. Uh, first, this briefing is being recorded. It will be available in, on the Chile YouTube channel this week. Uh, whether you are in person or joining us via Zoom, we encourage you to engage in the conversation today through social media. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Chili, and we ask you to help us sh uh, share the speaker's points of views. After, if you are joining us via Zoom, uh, in, in, uh, please type your questions into the Q&A section, not, not the chat, please. And for those joining us via Zoom as well, we also want you to know where you're from, so share that in the chat. And now please join me in welcoming uh, Chile board member and chair of the Chile Tech Talk, uh, Ilya Rodriguez with the center. Thank you, Mauricio. Thanks, everybody. I hope you guys will take it easy on me. It's been quite a while since I've been in front of a live audience. Um, so just bear with me. My name is Ilia Rodriguez, and I'm the Midwest Inclusion and Diversity Lead uh, for Accenture. I'm also the chair of the Tech Talk, uh, board, member of the board, and also really excited to be the new chair of the intern program. So super excited. I know some of you hear Accenture and are like, hmm, what does Accenture do? Are they an accounting firm? Uh, well, we are a global technology consulting firm um, with over 674,000 people around the world with 200 locations in 50 cities. Uh, Accenture's commitment to our people and accelerating equality uh, has never been more relevant than it is today. We are constantly taking action to create more employment and advancement for people of diversity. Uh, and although we've made considerable um, progress, we need to do more. Um, and we need to do more that we are, we are engaging and supporting and growing our Latino talent in technology. That is why I believe so much in Chile's global leaders program and internship programs. Um, to the dismay of many of my uh, members of the board, I like to take on as many Chilean interns as possible. Super excited, we have three uh, this, uh, this go around. So super excited about that. Um, and I wanna encourage our Chile interns while they're in DC to explore. Explore, explore, explore. Enjoy the city. Take advantage of all the different opportunities, including opportunities at tech companies like Accenture um, and others. Um, and the best part is you don't have to be tech fluent. Um, you don't have to be a software developer. I am not tech savvy at all, and I work for Accenture. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, at Accenture, we've developed a number of programs um, to bring in that talent, our skills to succeed program, as well as our internship program to ensure that we're tapping the talent at all levels um, in key areas in promising careers like cybersecurity. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're identifying as many of these sectors for our Latino talent as possible. Uh, the members of Congress that will be joining us today will be uh, Congressman Anthony Gonzalez and Congresswoman Young Kim from California. And I'm sorry, Congressman Gonzalez is from Ohio. Um, they all serve on the House Committee for Science and Space and, Te and Technology. And their diverse uh, voices on these topics help us to understand the critical need for more diversity in careers in technology. I'm excited to announce that our panel will be moderated by our very own Accenture um, leader. Um, I'm sorry, I'm like Ryan LaSalle. Sorry, Ryan. I'm like, wait a second, where did you go? I, who could it be? Our very own Ryan LaSalle, who is joining us. Ryan has been with Accenture for over 25 years and has been a leader in helping to address and improve diverse talent needs within the security uh, community. We also have amazing panelists uh, like Mariana Soto. Um, we also have Jose Cantu, my apologies. Did I get it right? Okay, my name is Ilya. People get it wrong all the time. So I wanna make sure. Um, and finally, uh, we have Dr. Jason Blessing with us as well. Um, I now want to turn it over to our distinguished uh, founder um, and leader chairman 
um, uh, uh, Diaz Ballard. And I wanna have him come up here, say a few words. Um, I've had the privilege of serving on the Chile board for now almost four years. So it's been a privilege to serve with you, sir. So if you could please give some remarks. Thank you so much, Ilya, and thank you for your leadership and for everything you, you've done, not only for today, this, this function, but uh, for generally for the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. And you know, what a wonderful concept, a wonderful topic, technology. I have an uncle, he's elderly, but his mind is so young. And for years, he's, he's for decades, he's persevered and he's a constructivist artist. Uh, which is nothing, there's no reference in the painting to anything outside of the painting. And, he, and for decades, he's been telling me, you know, that's so new because he's, he's an art historian. And he tells me art reflects the era uh, in which it's created. And it's so recent that a painting would not make reference to anything outside of the painting. It's not a drawing, it's not, no reference at all, just the colors on the painting. Change. He would tell me, we live in an era, and he's been telling me for decades, with more change and faster change than ever before in history. And this is simply his work of constructive, constructivist art is simply one manifestation of that as reflected in, in plastic arts. And in our lives, we see it so dramatically every single day. Marianne and I came here in an Uber, inconceivable a few years ago that that technology would have existed and the possibilities that have come with it. I just went through an experience that brought home the change we're living with such impact. When my father passed away in 2005, he had left me the manuscript of a memoir and I published it. And I remember there was a paperback, set number of books. A few years ago, we're running out. I, I said, I have to do another edition. Since the invention of the printing press, you would get a book, you would publish it, and then you had a certain amount of books and you had to save one if you ever, if you didn't want to lose it, save one so it can be copied again and you can have a second edition or a third edition. So since we ran out of books and I decided to have another edition of the book, now, and it's just in the last couple of days, that, and it's in both in Spanish and in English, so it's two books. They're not stored anywhere for the first time in history. It's not, okay, I have, like before, 10,000 books, let me store them. The publisher had to think, am I gonna be able to sell the books, have an investment to store, and then store the books? Um, now it's simply digital. And when you order the book, that's when it's published. That's when it's physically created and sent to you. That's brand new within the last couple of years, ever since the invention of the printing press. Now we have that change. That's in just that sphere. Imagine every sphere of our lives, the change we're living. Like my uncle said, more than any other time in history, it's a fascinating time to be alive. It's a fascinating time to be young and to learn and to be able to learn uh, technology and all the opportunities come with it. That's why for Chile, it's such a privilege to be, able to, to be able to be engaged with and involved with young people uh, that come here and are exposed not only to our nation's capital, but to things like today, the technology and the change that we're living. So what a privilege for Chile to be associated with all of you and to be able to uh, be connected to this topic that is so interesting and so relevant to our era. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, buenas tardes. So usually people say good afternoon or buenas tardes. Okay, good. So I'm Marianne Gomez Orta, uh, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute known as Chile. Thank you all for joining us um, in person and via Zoom. We're super appreciative, especially of those that have the opportunity to join us um, in Zoom because now I don't have to give my usual spiel to the audience here in the room, which is now that you know what's going on, you need to go tell people who were not in the room, but I don't have to say that now. Um, so I've got a couple of things to share with you before I, before I pass it on to our moderator today. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute is the premier organization funded, founded by members of Congress um, and also corporate leaders as Ilya and both are chairman Lincoln diaz Ballard referenced. Um, the organization is to advance the Hispanic community's economic progress with the focus on social responsibility and global competitiveness. Founded in 2003, we are a 501c3 leadership development nonprofit. The board of directors is comprised of a diverse group of people from diverse backgrounds and heritages. Uh, we also have people from both sides of the aisle, which is also very unique here in Washington. The briefing series themes are based on a combination of pressing issues on the Hill and also Chile's areas of focus, which include diversity of thought, as our vision statement says, we're about advancing the Hispanic community's diversity of thought, youth leadership development as demonstrated by our interns. So if you are a current intern fellow or an alum, raise your hands. Yay, okay, even if you went with Chile, I love it. Raise your hands. Um, Corporate responsibility, public service, obviously, commerce, fair trade, entrepreneurship, workforce development. We also touch on energy, environment, and as noted for today, technology and innovation. Through these briefing series, we do not attempt to influence legislation. We do not support nor oppose any specific legislation here in Washington or at the state or local level. We do want to make sure that we take the time to inform members and their staff and people like all of you here about the different topics that are being discussed on the Hill, uh, whether it's current legislation or upcoming legislation. Today's panel will be moderated, as mentioned, um, by Ryan uh, LaSalle. He will take the floor, uh, the stage here, and introduce everyone and get that show started. I also want to thank the sponsors. Uh, for the briefing series. So these are the sponsors that sponsor the whole series throughout the year. We try to have one briefing per quarter. And as things um, happen here in Washington, if necessary, we'll throw in another topic and another discussion of interest. The sponsors are Accenture, Amazon, Apple, American Petroleum Institute, Becker and Polyakov, BP America, Charter Communications, Chevron, Ducenta Squared, Ford Motor Company, General Motors, into it and the National Association of Broadcasters. Before I turn it to the comments by our members of Congress, um, I'd also like to just do a personal um, shout out to um, some friends who are here in Washington for a number of other meetings, but I want to recognize Mr. Julian Canetti with the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for being here and for bringing members of your delegation. So yes, go ahead and applaud, it's okay. Of course, it's very selfish because I'm from California. So, you know, um, hometown and the same hometown. Yes. Oh my gosh, how rare is that? Um, so, uh, please uh, note that we had a couple of members of Congress who were scheduled to be here in person. They were not able to make it in person, so they sent in their videos. Uh, we do want to recognize them as well for their time to do so. Um, and I'm going to mention their names, and that way we can go from one video to the next. Uh, Congresswoman Young Kim from California and Congressman Anthony Gonzalez from Ohio. Um, Congressman Anthony Gonzalez is also a board member of Chile. So with that, um, go ahead and roll the videos. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Young Kim representing California's 39th district. I am honored to be with you all today virtually for the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute's Tech Talk as we work together to improve cybersecurity. As a member of the Small Business Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee, and Science, Space, and Technology Committee, I understand how important cybersecurity is in today's interconnected world.
We must continue innovating and legislating to keep our system safe from cyber attacks and from foreign adversaries. Technologies allow us to connect with others, learn information at the push of a button, and allow entrepreneurs to excel and grow online. At the same time, cyber attacks are on the rise and putting American families, businesses, and government agencies at risk. As ranking member of the Small Business Subcommittee on Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Workforce Development, it's a top priority of mine to ensure our small business owners have the resources they need to operate safely online. During the COVID-19 pandemic, loan programs were created quickly to help businesses keep employees on payroll as communities were closed. Unfortunately, we also saw fraudulent applications and cybersecurity concerns at the Small Business Administration with these newly created programs. That's why I joined forces with my subcommittee chairman, Jason Crow from Colorado to introduce the SBA Cyber Awareness Act. This bipartisan bill would require the SBA to report annually to Congress on its IT and cybersecurity systems, how it can improve cybersecurity, and if any of its IT equipment were produced by an entity doing business in China. This bill passed the House, and I'm hopeful it will pass the Senate soon and head to the President's desk to become law. Our entrepreneurs are job creators. We must ensure that small business owners can safely and securely apply for capital they need to jumpstart their business and achieve their American dream. As we rely on technologies more, we also need more smart, creative, young students of all backgrounds working to innovate and promote cybersecurity and create policies that keep up with the 21st century. I'm proud to support Chile and look forward to seeing some of you in the halls of Congress one day. So please keep in touch and I hope we can meet in person soon. Thank you. Hello, Anthony Gonzalez here. So sorry that I couldn't be with you all in person today. Uh, for those of you who are veterans of Congress or have been around a while, you know that now that the Capitol is open and our schedules are somewhat back to normal, uh, getting on and off campus during a voting week is incredibly difficult um, because you have so many things happening in your office and around the Capitol. Uh, so my apologies for not being here, but I'm excited to share a quick message on uh, two technology issues that are front and center today and I think will be for a long time, one of which is cryptocurrency, uh, the other is cybersecurity. So first on cryptocurrencies, I started doing a, a pretty deep study on crypto, I'd say about a year and a half ago, maybe maybe a little longer than that. Someone in the midst of the pandemic, uh, when we were all locked up inside. And, you know, like most people, I had heard about these things, but I hadn't really spent much time on it. Um, and I went pretty deep. I listened to God knows how many podcasts um, and, and spent as much time as I could reading up on, on all the exciting things happening in the space. And I came to, to two big conclusions. The first one is that crypto slash Web3, which is sort of how it's been branded lately, um, can solve two pretty difficult challenges that frankly have frustrated me for a good bit of my adult life. Uh, the first is the power structures existing in the current internet era, the Web2 era. I'll talk about that in a second. The second is uh, the freezing out of minority communities and people who don't have sort of the inside track to the most exciting private investments in the world. Um, so I'll talk about each of those in kind. So first, how does it fix some of the problems of Web2? Well, the current version of the internet, as we all know, largely controlled by a handful of companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon. You might wanna throw a couple others in, but I'll focus largely on that. The way that those companies are structured from both a shareholder perspective, but also how the businesses run themselves is that the users essentially provide all the value. We give them all of our data. We use the product quote for free um, and they decide what we see, who we interact with, how we shop and what we get to consume on a daily basis. It's an enormous amount of power. Um, and, and we as the users, we just have to take whatever they give us. We have no control, no power. Even their shareholder structure is such that they have two different classes of shares. So. 
uh, they have voting shares, essentially super voting shares, and then just normal equity that you would buy in the stock market. So take Facebook, for example. I believe Mark Zuckerberg owns roughly 15% of Facebook, but he has 51% of the vote, which means that it doesn't matter how many people disagree with him. You can't do anything. You can't get rid of him as the CEO. You can't change any of the governance inside of Facebook. He will forever own 51% of the voting shares by virtue of the way the company is structured. Most tech companies that come public, they're structured that way. So they're largely unaccountable. We provide all the value by spending our time and contributing our data, and we get nothing for it, basically nothing. Uh, Web3 or crypto, it flips that all on its head. And how does it do that? Uh, it does that by giving actual governance rights to and decision-making authority to the people who hold the tokens that ultimately power the Web3 movement. So if you are a token holder, if you hold these assets and one of the projects wants to change a rule or, or if you want to propose a rule, you want to propose a change by virtue of the tokens you hold, you can vote those tokens, you can propose new governance, you can change what's actually happening inside of the projects. And if that's a good change, what happens? The value of the tokens go up. And so the value that you've provided by being a major user of the product, um, but also by contributing good ideas to the project, you directly benefit from that. So unlike Web 2, you contribute all the value, you get nothing in return. And Web 3, the more value you contribute, the more value you receive in return. I think it's an awesome setup uh, and it changes the, the incentive structure inside of the internet. Um, and so I'm incredibly excited for that. Are there problems? Of course there are, but I think that the problems are outweighed in my view by, uh, by the potential benefits. Second thing I, th I said was it, it can give you a chance as a retail investor uh, to, to get into some of the most exciting projects. Some of you may know I had an NFL career at one point living in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. And I was thinking, gosh, I would love to invest in some of these sort of more mobile internet companies. This was in 2007, eight, nine. Um, a lot of exciting things happening at the time. Unless you have like the best connections in the world, good luck getting into the funds, right? Like if you wanna get into the top venture capital funds, you've gotta have billions of dollars next to your name uh, and you have to have the best connections in the world so that you can get involved in those investments. It's enormously frustrating. So it freezes out everyday investors and puts more investing power uh, to the well-connected and, and the, the most wealthy or those who control the most assets. Really frustrating, doesn't make any sense, never felt fair to me. Uh, again, with crypto and Web3, kind of turns that on its head. Anybody who has an internet connection who can convert dollars into these cryptocurrencies can purchase tokens in the various projects that they think are the most exciting. Uh, and as I said earlier, they can contribute good ideas, they can contribute their time, their energy. Uh, and from that, they can participate in the value creation at the earliest stages uh, of company formation. So. Again, it gives more people access to more exciting investments uh, and does it in a way that I think is much more fair uh, and, and more democratic than the old version, which is, you know, the top venture capital funds get access to the top deals and the rest of us, we're just kind of sitting on the sidelines. So um, two really important things about, about the crypto Web3 movement uh, that, that I personally think are really exciting. As a policymaker, to me, because right, it's still very early. Um, there's plenty of room to run in this thing and it could go in a million directions. Uh, I think it's so nascent that our job is basically to make sure we don't break it. So let's, let's use the do not harm approach. Uh, let's take a step back. Let's foster the innovation, let it sprout. And then as it develops and we see what the various use cases are, then it will make sense in my view um, to put regulations on or, or legislation or whatever it is. Um, but right now, let's let it breathe. Let's let it happen um, and, and we'll adjust as we go. Now, cyber, this one's super quick and easy. Um, look, computing power is getting more robust. Uh, there are more people who are sophisticated with how they attack different systems. Every single company in the world uh, is gonna need to have some sort of cyber plan. The bigger you are, the more data you have, the more centralized your systems, the higher the, the level of security that you're gonna need. Um, my going assumption is always anything that I type or put on the internet or on my phone uh, is at risk. Um, and so from a personal hygiene standpoint, I think there's some basic things we need to do uh, as individuals to make sure that we're not passing sensitive information on or, or putting our, ourselves or our families at risk. Um, but from a company standpoint, 
we also need to take our responsibilities very seriously uh, and make sure that we have the systems in place uh, to prevent a major breach. I used to run a, a tech company and, and um, that was one of our top concerns. We had a bunch of parent student data. We were an education technology company uh, on our platform. And, and the, the one thing we knew uh, every time we had a quarterly meeting and we talk about, okay, what can kill the business? What's the one thing that could kill the business tomorrow? Uh, is that being vulnerable to a major cyber attack? Um, is, and, and I think that's true for a lot of businesses, certainly in the technology sector, um, but, uh, but across the entire economy. So two important topics, uh, two that I think will be with us for a long time. One that's sort of on the bleeding edge of, of innovation on the crypto side. A lot of promise, a lot to be figured out. Um, but, uh, but a lot of exciting opportunity there. And then on the cyber, uh, cyber side, uh, just sort of some good hygiene things that I think every company needs to be made aware of. So with that, thank you as always for allowing me to spend a couple minutes with you. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person and God bless. All right, well, thank you again to our two members who joined us, even though it was in video, uh, we got a little bit of texture about their concerns, what they're working on. So. I see the moderator and the panelists going, mm hmm, mm hmm, no, yes, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation because it's always very interesting. This has become our annual tech talk for that reason. No matter what happens, there's people in the room who have the yes, no, and members of Congress are still kind of sometimes learning some of these things. Um, so thank you again. And the floor is yours for the moderator. Ryan, come on up, dear. Uh, we've already had your introduction, and I know people are eager to get into the conversation. So, all are yours, dear. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we're all nodding. Yes, cyber is very easy. Uh, it's very simple. We got it. Uh, actually, I like the, I like how he said it. It, it, it is very. It, his point was very simple. It's everybody's problem. So I, I did. I did like that. So, uh, not to, not saying anything for the, for the congressman. Um, We've got an amazing panel today, and um, we're talking about how to uh, start a career in cybersecurity technology and innovation. And the first thing I'll say is those aren't different things. They're very intertwined. To think about innovation without cybersecurity means you're disrupting and you're not being safe. So there's a way to do this that all comes together. We're gonna to talk about a lot of different things today. The first thing I'll say is, as a reminder, Marisa said it too, this is being recorded. So uh, we'll have a, qu a question and answer at the end as well. You can follow up later on. Um, if you're connected via Zoom, please put your questions in the chat and someone will, uh, will allow them into the, to our presenters. So let me introduce our panelists. And as I introduce you guys, come on up. So we'll start with Dr. Jason Blessing. He's the Gene Kirkpatrick Visiting Research Fellow with the Foreign and Defense Policy Department at the American Enterprise Institute. His research focuses on US cyber strategy, emerging threats, international relations, cybersecurity, and transatlantic defense. Small stuff. He's, he's previously held positions with the International Institute for Strategic Studies, the Johns Hopkins University School for Advanced uh, International Studies, and the United States Institute of Peace. As a former fraud, fraud operations analyst in the financial sector, Dr. Blessing is also, also has the practical experience with the digital challenges facing all American businesses. Next. We will uh, bring up Jose Cantu. He's the Federal Deployment Manager at Palo Alto Networks. He's an experienced cybersecurity professional serving federal, civil, defense, and intel clients. We caught a little bit earlier, uh, being a little bit more his focus on the mission, which I think is really uh, a unique capability, a unique thread that holds a lot of cyber people together, this focus on uh, being on the right side of, of the mission. His areas of experience include attack service management, cybersecurity shared services, behavioral biometrics, identity and access management, and insider threat. Outside of work, he's passionate about college access for underserved students and works with multiple community-based organizations, including serving on the board of directors for the Houston-based Emerge Fellowship. Mr. Cantu well, yeah, <laughs> holds a Bachelor of Science <laughs> in Foreign Service degree with a major in Science, Technology, and International Affairs from Georgetown University. Nice. Okay. <laughs> and our final panelist is Myrna Soto. She's the CEO and founder at Apogee Executive Advisors. Apogee Executive Advisors focuses on providing strategic consulting in areas of technology, risk, and cybersecurity, in addition to technology integration and enterprise risk management. The firm's work is specific to executive leaders and boards in the public and private sectors. 
In this capacity, she also serves as a strategic advisor on the advisory boards of multiple privately held organizations. Uh, Myrna's had roles in venture capital in, as a COO of a startup, and where I met her when she was the uh, enterprise security uh, chief information security officer at Comcast. So we've known each other for almost a decade, I think now. So it's uh, it's pretty awesome. This is a powerhouse team. We're going to start our conversation today focusing on from the perspective of a young professional who wants to get into this market. And we're going to go all over the place, cybersecurity, technology, and policy. And we're going to spend some time talking about all those different things, because I think this is a big challenge. And it's more than just uh, how, how do each of you individually think about the next steps in your career and think more about how do we make this something that everybody has access to. Um, so first, let's talk about the stark reality of the cyber workforce in the US today. 4% of cybersecurity workers self-identify as Hispanic, 9% is Black, and 24% is women. This is a huge challenge. Across the globe, we also have 3 million fewer qualified cybersecurity talent than we have jobs. There's a big imbalance and a huge opportunity. This is something that we can, we can do a lot more on, we can get right. Part of the challenge of fixing that number though is being able to see how do you find your way if you don't see role models who look like you, who came from the same kind of journey, who you can relate to. I think we've got a couple of people here that can help us make that, make that very real. So let's start with Myrna. She's like the share of Madonna of cybersecurity guys. <laughs> if you walk into a room and say Myrna, everyone knows exactly who you're talking about. In a cyber room. In a cyber room. <laughs> <laughs> She's the, yeah, yeah. Madonna and Cher have their rooms too. It's okay. Um, but you know, she's, she's been on this, a tremendous career journey. And I'm, I'm really interested in having her share with you the journey she took from where she got started in this, in this market and how she made it to the C-suite in the boardroom. So Myrna, you want to spend a little time sharing your story with us? How much time do we have? We have I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so thank you, Ryan. Thank you for that introduction and thank you to the entire Chile organization, Marianne in particular for inviting me here today. This is um, a very interesting, um, cause I'm one of a anniversary event because the last time I did the Chile Tech Talk was during the last week of my career at Comcast. And I had the pleasure of being able to talk about the different things that we were doing at Comcast around this very same um, subject matter and the pandemic hit and now we're back. So I'm glad that we're back. Um, but uh, just to answer your question, Ryan, and for those of you that are listening, you know, my path into a career in cybersecurity was not traditional. Um, my college career track was in psychology I had a very different outlook of what I wanted to do professionally. And um, as a young person starting out my operational career as a business owner and a business management individual, um, I quickly learned very much the same things that were being discussed earlier by the members of Congress and others today, how innovation and automation is so important for the agility of business. So I became enamored with the opportunity to use technology in the business line that I was in. The story is way too long, but that was my introduction into technology when I became a little bit of a squeaky wheel, go figure, requiring and asking for more technology. Got involved in a number of projects as a business owner, when I say a business owner, a line owner of the business and quickly became immersed in the technology sector I then had an opportunity, which was another by chance opportunity to lead a security design practice for American Express. The reason why I'm mentioning these things is that my track was not normal. It wasn't the, the route, everyone thinks about their route in their career. You go from point A to point B to point C. For me, every single one of my turns came at either a chance moment, a stretch opportunity, and quite honestly, I know Marianne knows this story, or actually getting pushed by one of my leaders to do something different, which was this thing called cyber. And at the time I was not into it. I said, no, don't wanna do that. And I think about it today, and it was the best decision that I ever made in my career that I didn't even make. Someone made it for me. Someone saw something in me. 
But one of the things that I think is really important for everyone to understand is that progression came with the responsibility to represent my community, represent my Hispanic community, represent females and technology, and in particular in the cybersecurity world, which we are very, very outnumbered even to this day. I know that Ryan just shared the metrics. But I'm honored with the fact that I've been able to accelerate my career and move into different positions with various companies and now have the opportunity to serve as a board member for many large scale publicly traded organizations. And now I have the chance to advocate for those of you that are interested in careers in this field to make sure that those opportunities exist. I love it. Um, a couple of things I got out of Myrna's uh, career journey, partly because I know her, uh, but she has made a career out of being a squeaky wheel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a squeaky wheel who brings value. And I think that notion of the business background before she got into security is really important. This is a space that is not a technology problem. This is absolutely a business and risk problem. And the people who can understand that and can communicate that way are much more successful in this space. And others who have started in technology like me took a lot of time to try to figure out how to learn a new language, a new language of business to be able to uh, make, the, make, that, make that leap. So I think that's real, really exciting. Uh, we, won't, we won't call you the squeaky wheel, but, <laughs> the, the, but, the, but the, the point is really is real because the value is coming from raising your hand and when you see something that's wrong or when you see a need and being an advocate and being able to make a business case for that stuff is really important in security. Okay, Jose, I wanna to go to you next. Yep. Um, Jose is working right on the front lines of cyber defense today. He is helping defend and protect some of the most critical infrastructure we have. When a young professional comes to you and wants to know how do they get started, what's some of the advice you give them on how to break in? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I would actually start talking about our college students. First and foremost, study what you want. There really aren't cybersecurity majors. I don't know a single cybersecurity professional that actually studied <laughs> cybersecurity, and I'm sure all of you can relate. There's cybersecurity master's programs, but when it comes to undergrad, study what you want. Second, sit in the front of the class and network your way to wherever you need to be. That's how I got my career started. I uh, studied international relations. I had never really saw a career in cybersecurity until the right opportunity popped up because I, a professor overheard me. A professor overheard me talking about where I wanted to be, what kind of things I wanted to do for the national security mission. And that turned into an internship, my junior spring, which turned into my first full-time job. And that kicked off my entire career. Beyond that, for young professionals, if you already started a career, uh, what I would recommend is network your way. Network your way to where you need to be. Talk with us up here talk with everyone here in the crowd that can help plug you where you need to be. Uh, and I say this thinking about the, uh, thinking about the job market as a whole. I think uh, cybersecurity as, as a field doesn't do a very good job at providing entry level opportunities for recent grads. There are some organizations that do. Accenture, I'm sure has a really, really good entry level program. I came from Deloitte, very similar, uh, very good building up of the skills, but network your way. And if needed, there are certification programs, there are master's programs that give you the skills that you need. But the majority of these you actually pick up on the job. I don't have a coding background. I don't have a particularly technical background, but was able to learn it through experience. Yeah, I, I love I love all three of those um, pieces. I think I think one of the things you know, it is not different in cybersecurity than in any other industry. If you are inspired to learn and continuously, continuously sharpen your skills and develop, you'll do well. And I think that, that there are there are uh, there is a barrier in cybersecurity because there's a mystery. It sounds it sounds spooky. It's, it, sounds, it sounds a little boring. It, it kind of depends. But this notion of like how do you break in? I think there, there are also, the other thing I'll say is there are also other programs. There's, there's retraining programs, there's reskilling programs, and there's things you can do to sort of invest in yourself along the way to build up your, um, to build up your attractiveness to other employers in cybersecurity. Okay, Jason, I'm coming on to you. Um, you are very deep 
in global politics and national security and those implications of cyber. I, I've read a bunch of his papers uh, over the weekend, and I felt like I, you know, as a person who spends all this time thinking about cybersecurity, I actually learned a few things that I didn't know about some of the different cyber conflicts going on. So um, that was awesome. The reality our companies and individuals face is evolving really quickly, though. And I think it's we saw a huge leap, leap ahead with Ukraine and the awareness of all of our businesses in the US around the threat of Russia to our way of life from cybersecurity. So I'm curious, as you think about this thing, what should we all be watching about and learning and taking away from these big global events that actually have kind of personal implications? What, what, what can we take away from this? Right, that's, a, that's fantastic, Ryan. And I, first, I wanna echo what my fellow panelists have said. I started out answering phones and customer service as a job and then right time, right place, job opened up, uh -huh. I learned on the job, uh, some you know basic technical skills, and then took a U-turn and paid for it. But that's to say that the field's wide open. Uh, but I think uh, the question really is about what the problem is, how we, how we define the problem of cybersecurity, uh, sort of broadly and globally, and the, how some of the trends speak to why diversity is so important, uh, and particularly now more than ever. So I see really three big trends that have started to happen. One is that the playing field is just more active. There's more people coming online in a, in a very good way, right? We've got global populations that are coming online at faster speeds and routes than we've had ever before. On the other side though, that means there's a lot more room for malicious activity. So it's a crowded playing field. Second is we're seeing much more sophistication in what goes on. And if we focus just on the threat side, right? The, 10 years ago, a lot of the ransomware incidents or you know, wiperware incidents where just completely wrecks the data on your computer uh, without thinking twice and very efficiently, the, the technical stuff behind that, we couldn't have imagined would have been this easy 10 years ago. Now we have twice the sophistication for half the price of, in terms of what's going on uh, in the ecosystem. We call that innovation. It's true. <laughs> I'm it's an academic, true. so I have, to, I have to spend so many words. Uh, but the, the innovation is uh, unprecedented at the speed at which it's occurring. And then third is you're increasingly seeing that individual and business choices are directly linking to national security uh, in the sense that uh, a lot of these bad actors or, you know, whether they're nation states or criminal groups, uh, they're able to reach into our supply chains past sort of the initial target, right? Uh, and I'm thinking of, for instance, you know, with the solar winds hack. You compromise one company's piece of software, manipulate it, and then you're able to access downstream a number of Fortune 500 companies and U.S. government agencies. Uh, so you've got this, this element of where you know, the downstream effects are, are much larger. So what do we do about it, and why is diversity so important? One solution is obviously, as Congressman said, hygiene, right? That's, that's increasingly important. Uh, what's overlooked for a lot of us, though, is the power of our decisions in our wallet and of business contracts, right? Uh, in the past, hypothetically, there may have been a digital service that is much cheaper and efficient from a Chinese company uh, as compared to a German company, let's say. Uh, but now the question is, how do we make that security decision a better business practice? Uh, you know, and we see this with the conversation of 5G communications infrastructure and Huawei. Uh, but finally, all of this, to wrap this up, the point is that this is an increasingly complex and increasingly sophisticated problem, an increasingly diverse problem that touches on every part of our life. Business leaders and policymakers have to understand that to address this in any comprehensive way, there has to be a diversity of background, diversity of experience, and a diversity of point of view for solutions. I love bringing those two points together. This notion of, of having a lot of different perspectives helps us better react to and respond to the diversity of threats, the diversity of activity that's happening. And the other piece, I think many, many organizations have been able to think, not, not think about politics as they think about the decisions they're trying to make to um, gain market share, to take on new customers, to innovate. But I think increasingly that is a big part of the risk equation for how businesses operate. And so I think that that's another piece that trying to make the big world personal and individual and understand how it affects the decisions we're making every day from a risk perspective. Okay, Jose, back to you. Um, you worked inside organizations, both in operational roles and servicing some of those organizations as a provider. You've been on kind of both sides. If, you, if I'm thinking about 
getting into this into this business and I'm trying to figure out do I want to be uh, a ser- you know in the services sector do I want to be a consultant do I want to be in the operational side do I want to be part of an organization defending their, themselves what's different about working on different you know for an agency or for a company's defense team versus being a solution or service provider so for me uh, what I would recommend is first start with yourself What is it that you value and where is it that you want to try to plug in? I am personally very passionate about the national security mission. And when I was looking at the overall landscape, I saw a lot of really hardworking teams doing some really amazing work. A lot of them doing it very, very well. Uh, There is always a manpower issue in cyber as everyone here can absolutely attest, but I saw my value uh, or I saw myself bringing the most value to a broader mission set uh, through being a service provider by identifying and filling in gaps that I saw across the board. This is where, at least for me, working in attack surface management, trying to identify all of your uh, potentially vulnerable assets to help you uh, patch them before they get hacked, before the Russians, before the Chinese get to them, right? I saw uh, the closest alignment to my values by jumping into that mission. Um, However, from there, start with yourself because at the end of the day, you as a professional are the most important person and you will be most fulfilled, most satisfied when you have that personal connection, personal alignment, to what it is that you're doing. Yeah, I, I love that. I think I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but this notion of a, mission, a sense of mission, I think is something that holds true across the whole cyber workforce. That, um, there's a sense that we're all Batman, we're all C- Captain Marvel. We are all <laughs> up on the wall defending uh, our way of life from people who want to take that away. And it, it, it gives a different purpose to your, to your work every day. If what you're trying to do uh, and not to not to minimize anybody who's like really into like the new Web three stuff and uh, wants to try to figure out you know, the next realm of crypto, that's exciting too. Uh, but this notion of actually defending our way of life, I think, um, draws a, a different kind of person who wakes up every day excited to give it their all with a with an intellectual problem set that is almost unsolvable. So I think that you know it's it's this is a, if that, if you see yourself in there, and you want to continue to learn. Then I think that you know what Jose said is I think is is spot on. Okay, Myrna, I want to get specific about the Hispanic community because that's what that's why we're here today. I think with the high demand for resources in this area, what what kind of things can we do to promote more opportunities in cybersecurity for Hispanic professionals? What are some of the barriers they're facing too along the way? Before I address that, I want to make sure since you said Marvel and Captain America that we don't forget about Wonder Woman. Who's Captain also Marvel's a woman. <laughs> We got to make sure that the women are represented. Um, uh, no, to, but to address your question, so you know the the reality is is that everything that was mentioned up here today, we talk about the opportunities, we talk about the education, we talk about the chance moments, we talk about study what makes sense for you, and be mission driven. And you notice that the minute they said national security, my head went up and down because that is you know obviously I think we're all cut from the same cloth by default that that is a critical component of why we do what we do. What do we need? We need our community. I'm speaking to our Hispanic community. We need our community to have more opportunities for those chance moments. We need to make sure that companies understand that that diversity of thought includes the diversity of the Hispanic consumer. Yes, there is national security challenges, too many to mention, but there's also consumer security issues. There's also issues in our local governments. There's also issues with the systems that run our municipalities. We need to make sure that we're having those type of opportunities for that English major or that psychology major, that non-engineer to be able to bring their perspectives into this problem called cyber. Some of the most brightest people that I've had the honor of working with are people that were not necessarily engineers. Some of them were mathematicians, some of them were in finance. Some of them just brought a very, very core diversity of thought to the problem at hand. I think that's one of the first things that we need to do. It's very frustrated with the way that recruitment happens in cyber. There was someone that tweeted something this morning, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna go a little long here, but 
someone tweeted uh, a job this morning and the reaction to the job was just a plethora because the job description showed the pay range, right? Right in the, right in the description. And the dialogue that happened on Twitter afterwards was no one is qualified. The list of the qualifications went so far along that in order to find that person, it would just be literally impossible. So we need a different way of looking at who is qualified, what skills can be ported to this, pro to this type of profession, and how can we train people? You mentioned it perfectly, learned on the job. These are things that we need to kind of embrace and we need to have more internship programs and we need to have more mentorship programs and we need to be able to invest in people that may not necessarily be productive in the role in the onset because you're learning and that businesses need to be okay with that. There are over 3 million open cybersecurity jobs. 3 million open cybersecurity jobs. That is insane. We need to have more of our community represented in that talent pool. The last thing that I'll mention is the fact that we also need to be, and I'm, when I say we, I'm speaking from industry, from business, we need to be much more open to the non-traditional education tracks. Um, I said this recently, about a week ago, about my journey and how my education came together. And it started in community college. We need to be embracing members of our community that are going through community college and or other universities and to make sure that we have the equal opportunity to try to get into this space. Last but not least, this is less about education. This is a little less about skill set development. This is more about the national security issue. And that is we need more private and public collaboration and alignment between private industry and our government to work together to safeguard our nation. And I say that with a degree of passion. You may have heard that in my voice because when I was an executive at Comcast, I spent a lot of time here in this city advocating for that. And there needs to be much more of a two-way information sharing and intelligence gathering to protect us. Yeah, I, I can't emphasize enough the point she just made. This notion of the over-credentialing of, of job recs is a, is a huge challenge. Of those 3 million jobs, Almost nobody in the industry today could get any of those jobs. They've, they've made it impossible. People hiring managers make it impossible. And I don't understand why. We've gone through in our, I'll just talk, a couple of things that we're doing to make this more accessible. We've gone through all of our job recs and tried to really win it down just to the core skills. We did that for two reasons. One is to open the pool of applicants. The second is very specifically, we've seen that women only apply to jobs when they feel like they, hire, they have all the recs. Men apply to jobs where they've got like, like 30%. Like, ah, I'll we'll figure it out. So if we want to improve our, our access to, to a, gender, a gender diverse or uh, talent pool, we gotta make sure that we're advertising it that way. We've gone through and looked at the kind of language that people that are, is in here. A lot of technology language is kind of racially charged. We need to take that out too, because there, there's, there's this notion, there's a kind of like this alpha male language it's using all this stuff we need to take all that out if we need to be if we want to be attractive to the people that we want to have be part of our, our, our business that's one the other thing we've done is looked at it looked really hard to say our four-year college degrees a requirement in at least 20 percent of our jobs they're not for extension in north america 20 percent of our jobs no longer require a four-year degree that is a huge change from the way the consulting organizations have ever have ever done anything and we are putting our, our money and our training where our mouth is by making sure that we have access to experiences and training. So when people get into the business, they can be successful here, even if they don't have that huge long list of expectations. So there's a handful of those kinds of things. And then, we, and then we've partnered a lot with other organizations, public-private partnerships that are, are creating programs where government service can turn into a training ground for you and forgive student loans. That, that's a pretty amazing thing. If you go to, to two, two or three years of government service in a cyber capacity, you learn all the things that Jose talked about in terms of the national security fundamentals of, of helping to defend our country. And then you come out to a company like Accenture or Microsoft and we pay your student loans off. That creates a, a whole new level of access for people who ha have, to, have to make hard decisions when they come out of school. I had a lot of student loans. 
I could not go work in a nonprofit. I needed to go work in a place that I could, I could pay down my, my loans. And so knowing what that looks like means that we can create a different and more attractive set of opportunities for a different and more diverse workforce. And the Myrna's point about other skills and Jose's too, to study what you love. If you study what you love, you'll be successful. And if you continue to learn and find your way to bring your passion every day, you will find a way to make it in security as well, if that's what you, if that's what you love. We have sociologists, anthropologists, criminologists, uh, all kinds of different people who have come from different walks of life, people who worked in, in bank fraud, who are now cyber investigators, because that is a really great adjacent skill. And they came over from having to deal with call center fraud before, and now they're thinking about cyber attackers. And there's a lot of adjacency to figure out how to pivot your skills. So just a couple of things I wanna make sure that we talk about that are, re are real programs that are actually trying to make a difference in how we get to a, a, a much bigger workforce. I, I have I have 1,500 employees in North America, and we're gonna hire probably another uh, three or 400 next year, just in security. And, th and that's this is how we're this is how we're doing it. Part of the equation. Okay, Jason. Uh, Jason, I'm curious. We talked about geopolitical events. We talked about some of, the, some of these other things. I want to talk more about innovation now in crypto markets and the other kinds of technology innovation that's happening. How, how are these big innovations impacting communities? Big events and sort of big leaps forward. You know, if we think about uh, Moore's law, for example, every two years, you could be a double, right? Uh, sort of speeding up and becoming yeah. obsolete in itself, to a degree, right? The, the issue with innovation in communities, though, is it pushes the boundaries of what we find possible, what we find plausible, and how we address and how we talk and think about, you know, in the instance of cybersecurity. Uh, pushes it past a purely technical understanding. I think we would all agree that we've moved, moved to where it's a political, societal, individual issue, right? Uh, so it pushes the conversation. Uh, and on one hand, lots of regulations lag behind technological progress. That is absolutely no surprise. The public-private cooperation, we can talk about that for quite some time, uh, but I won't uh, <laughs> save for time. But uh, in, in pushing the boundaries of how we think and how we define what the issues of the day are, particularly in terms of innovation and technology, uh, I want to draw a line from that to the importance of soft skills in opportunities for communities, right? We've talked a lot about how, you know, you don't have to be a coder or an engineer or a software developer to get into this field, right? Uh, and with innovation and pushing the boundaries of how we think about this, it's imperative to realize that, again, it's not just a technical problem with a technical solution. And where businesses and education is really lagging behind is identifying and helping cultivate these soft skills in communities, right? And particularly underrepresented communities in business and different sectors of society, right? Uh, cultivating in these soft skills and particularly a translation role, you know, which hits on a lot of everything that's already been said is do what you want, find that pressure point where things aren't quite lining up and where you can make a difference. But the question is with innovation, how do we find how to translate from the technical to the policy, right? Or to the decision makers, you know, with innovation, it, it's going to increase a CEO's risk portfolio. You know, that's just risk is a part of innovation. Uh, at the same time, you're going to have a CTO that is focused, you know, with the innovation, there's going to be much more of the grasping the technological implications. The question is how we find people to translate between those two communities, right? So innovation really drives home the point that we need more people across different fields, psychology, sociology, political science, uh, you know, after my own heart. And uh, how do we get people in these roles and how do we make roles in business and in government for these people to translate between technical and I just spent um, an hour and a half today talking to 50 different companies about the role of the metaverse and the role of security in the metaverse. But the thing I thought was so important about the whole thing was that to, to your point, there was this piece that was missing about just because you can, should you? And the safety and integrity and the impact to communities was, was, uh, wasn't, it was why we were having the conversation. So it wasn't missing from that conversation, but it, it was missing from so many of the applications that were being built every day. And I think that that, that, is, a, that, that is not cybersecurity, but it is absolutely a, a critical, critical function for, for different communities to, to really advocate for, to make sure that we're responsibly innovating. 
And if I may add, <clears throat> and I apologize, I'm going to take you off script a no, little no, bit this here. This might be my script, actually. Oh, good. <laughs> um, one of the things for our community, for the Hispanic community, that, that I think is always lacking, something that we need to address, is the trust factor that our community has around the application of technology, the collection of data. What are you going to do with it? Does it is it going to harm my family? Is it going to what is it going to do to my community? So spot on to what you were speaking of is about pulling that string of innovation and what does it mean? We need to make sure that we build pu public policy, that we embrace technologies, but that we have a higher expectation about how companies are going to manage our data, whether it's via policy, whether it's via whatever, whatever we can do, because I fear that we have all these, these innovations that our community could take advantage of, but there are so many members of our community that are fearful of using technology and they'll refer back and say, no, 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 mira lo que pasó, you know, over here, look what happened over there, look what happened over there, I'm not going to do that. So just, just a point of context, just because we can, should we, and do if, if we do, how do we bring along the user base to trust the technology? So you did hit me off a of script a little bit, but only a little, only a little, because I, what I want you, I, I would love you for you to put your investor hat on and think about when you were investing in innovation and investing in technologies and investing in new and new, new companies. How did you think about your role as an investor and as an advocate for the Hispanic community? And what did you see in the innovation landscape that, uh, that this community should be thinking about and, and listening to? Well, you know what, I just, I gave you part of my answer already. And when I was looking at <clears throat> some of the early stage companies, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the questions that I would ask for those founders and the people that were advocating for dollars, number one was, what did your team look like? Who do you have on your team that represents this community? And unfortunately, very often there were none. Yeah. So there was a strong advocation to say, how do we change the look of the founders that are getting access to capital? that are able to build innovative products, particularly in the cybersecurity space. So that would be one. The second is many technology, even early, very early stage companies, technology companies, they'll develop fast, they'll run, they'll release products, and they kind of forget that this whole trust factor and building in security by design, there is nothing worse than having a cybersecurity company have a breach. So when you sit there and you look at cybersecurity portfolio companies that are pitching for capital investments, I had the advantage of being able to poke holes in what they were doing and say, have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? And the minute they're like, no, like, okay, next, what's the next, what's the next potential investment? So it's really something that it's, it's about what that does that team look like? What are the contributions of the team and how are they building that trust in the technology that they're developing? I'll take just a quick minute because on that point, this notion of trust is really, really important. And um, some of the big platform companies know that their business is completely, completely dependent on the trust of their users. Some don't care and some do. And uh, there was one, and I can't, I won't get into the details of who it was, but their CEO realized during the pandemic that their, that their recommendation engine had racial bias in it. And they spent a lot of time and a lot of money to fix that because they felt like they couldn't be the platform business they wanted to be if they weren't really representing all of their users. And I thought that, and their CEO said, it was probably the most important thing he could do since taking the company public. So there are companies that really get this. They really, they really do. So the other thing I'd say is when you're looking to find a career, look for a company whose values match your own. Cause I think that's also really, Amen. really important. Okay. We've had a ton of download out of these folks heads. What did we not answer? What questions do you have for them? And uh, let's go around. Go, go ahead. I think it went, they got a mic. They we want got a mic for you. Hi, everyone. My name is Audrey. I'm a global leader. I'm interning for Accenture this, <laughs> right now, so that's super cool. And I'm studying computer science. Um, my questions are, or my question is, Based on your experience, what programming languages or tools are really important in your job from a technical standpoint? Was it you want to take that one? Uh, yeah. Maybe the closest? Uh, <laughs> um, so I will start off by saying that I haven't really encountered any need for programming languages within 
my realm of cyber. Uh, however, I would advocate one, learning C++. I took two intro courses in college and just having an understanding of how this works, having an understanding around object-oriented programming allows you to conceptually understand how these systems operate. And then the second, uh, when thinking about you know, where to focus your energies or where to study, I would definitely recommend getting a base level understanding of how does the internet work? Because I could tell you that the vast majority of people do not know. That stumped me uh, when I was applying to a cybersecurity job and they were like, explain to me how it works. And I said, uh, let me get back to you. <laughs> Type in a URL and yeah. go to the page. <laughs> Um, a, a, a couple of things I'd add on to that. I think, I think this notion of understanding programming languages is important. So much of the issues in cybersecurity are from the way products are developed. And understanding the software development life cycle, how does, it, how does someone go from an idea to a piece of code to a product is really, really helpful. And understanding C++ or, or, or another kind of enterprise class programming language is really, is really good. Um, the other piece I'd say onto that is increasingly the cloud is run on Python. And, and, and so much of what we try to do to help automate and make security easier to accelerate the adoption and migration to the cloud requires people who can at least script in Python because that, that and, and people learn it pretty quickly. Ironically enough, Python is very simple to learn. My 14 year old is doing that. Yeah. <laughs> just, to, just to add on that, if I, going back to the beginning of grad school, if I, instead of being grandfathered into a program like Stata, uh, which that shows my age, but uh, <laughs> I, I wish I had learned Python because not only in cybersecurity, but more broadly, if you're handling, handling big batches of data, yeah. there's nothing better than being able to manipulate it uh, and understand how to manipulate data in that sense. And that's a skill that carries you know, across uh, career fields. Yep, yeah, I agree. That's a great question. You're welcome. <laughs> Oscar Mazzaberry with World Data. Um, we all agree that cybersecurity is a big, has a big spectrum, but I'm surprised I haven't heard uh, one major challenge, and it's how to recover as human beings the control of our digital persona, because that that's where the where the stability of a country hinders, and we're leaving part of that. I don't want to go deeper. But that's one of the things, for instance, that the approaches that we're following in our group is through verifiable credentials and so forth, where Web3 intersects this whole field. But I, I just wonder if you guys have touched yeah. upon that, because I consider that fundamental to the existence of yeah. our civilization. Yeah, I, I, think, you. I think you're right. And if you... Um... If we all would have been together in that uh, tech talk a few years back before the pandemic, one of the things that we talked about was our digital identities and the importance to manage them up and including participating in various platforms. But I think more important, and we could have a complete talk, I know that these guys would have tons to say about it as well, is we do have a responsibility Congressman said it, we have a responsibility to take ownership of our participation, right? And what happens is, is that when we look at these big bad companies, and I'm saying this tongue in cheek because I don't necessarily feel that they're as evil as they may be projected to be. When we look at these big bad companies that let you use the platform for free and you are the product, you are the one deciding what to put out there, what to share, how you decide to authenticate or not. And more often than not, we tend, the human element is, we tend to go the easiest route. Oh, another password. Oh, another authentication protocol. Oh, another this. The reality is I love it when my bank calls me and says, hey, we don't know if this is really you. Thank you. Thank you for calling me yeah. because I really care that you are caring for my account, for who I am and my identity with the evolution of the metaverse and how our digital identities could then now be projected and utilized and presented as live. 
whole other tech talk. Marianne, take notes. We have to yeah, do that yeah, one next time. <laughs> but yes, it's critically important. And we need to we need to understand that ease of use equals less security. Um, and you guys want to weigh in on uh, just to echo that? It, I mean, part of the problem is sort of the business ecosystem, right? Uh, uh, and at the same time, there is the impetus for individual responsibility over what you do. But the, the problem is answering the question that I give to my cousin back home, which is, why should I care what people do with all my information? It doesn't affect me. Well, not, not right now. Uh, so there is, there is, at the same, there needs to be more consumer education that goes on on linking the concrete because a lot of this can feel distant. The the concrete implications, you know, we can talk about abstract, you know, liberty, privacy, but we need to be able to educate people on exactly why this matters and why you should take the extra ten seconds to have multi factor yeah. authentication. It, it, it's interesting because I have seen throughout my career that the perspectives on this go either way this way or way the other. It's either, I don't care, it doesn't matter, to I don't trust anything, I'm not entering my name or number in this. I don't care if the government's gonna give me a PPP loan, I'm not gonna do it, using that as a very overt example. So it's interesting, how do we find that middle ground and how do we create a much more literate society on the implication? I think that's what you're, what you're hitting on is the impact of what it is that we're doing and understanding it. I'm not, not to pick on this particular industry, but years ago when the DNA companies of 23andMe and the Ancestries came out, I was on stage one time and said, I would never do one of those tests, never. And I was moderately booed. And they said, why? And I said, because I don't know how that data is gonna be used later. I don't know if they're going to then harvest, not them, but someone else could potentially harvest data on our community and say, well, you know what? Insurance rates for all Latinos based on these DNA tests and findings are gonna you know, go up. We have to charge you more because you have a higher propensity for this or for that. Some of those statistics exist today, but why would I give that up freely when it could be misinterpreted without context? Yeah, two things I'll say just real quick on this. Uh, one thing I saw today that was fascinating was when Cambridge Analytica had their breach and they showed all the different Facebook data that they had mined as part of the 2016 election, right? It, the, for any given person, there were about 2,000 different factors they could profile people on. When Stanford looked at what happens inside a given room in the metaverse, you could observe 20,000 data points from a person behaviorally in 20 minutes. The amount of information you can, you can suck in and understand is tremendous. And so understanding, having that visibility and transparency is going to be really critical to us understanding, understanding how it gets used and then advocating for the things we need to, to get right. The other piece about that is that, that identity. In not, all this falls apart if we don't have some level of trusted identities because you can't move between all the platforms and you can't have 15 different consumer identities and still exist productively in the metaverse. There's, there's gonna have to be something like what you're talking about in terms of a trusted backbone for doing these kinds of things. The, the last thing I'll say is, to the, to the DNA test, we have a social contract with a lot of different things that happen every day. Uh, you still speed on the highway, even though you've got easy pass. There, there's a social contract that if they ever gave you a speeding ticket for going between tobos too fast, you would stop using it and they would stop having your money. Right? So there's gotta be these different yeah. social contracts that have to evolve, but we need to establish them and advocate for them. And that's a big, that, that is, maybe it's government, Maybe it's just policy. It may not be government, but we've got to get out there and, and keep advocating for what we think the future needs to look like with our values. Up here first. Up here first. Okay. Yes, waiting. Hello, uh, Paola Arellano. I am also a global leader, um, like Audrey. I am interning with the government relations team on Home Depot. And so my question is more policy related. Um, Seeing that cybersecurity is such a major issue, what do you guys ask of policymakers? What is the most permanent um, maybe policy that you're wanting them to sign on to or wanting them not to sign on to? Um, thank you. Hmm. This could be trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to comment? Now that I am an independent and I no longer work for a large corporation, I can say this. Um, there's a couple of things. One in particular is 
going back to that public private partnership years ago in 2013 and we were advocating for the cybersecurity legislation at the time to have a degree of liability protections for companies that would participate in sharing knowledge of whatever type of attack data a threat data that they may be mining and and have purview to in their organization that we could share with the government to say hey we're seeing this let's make sure that we understand this these threat vectors there was always a little bit of consternation to protect the companies from doing that. And if you think about it, it's kind of like a backward uh, paradox because you're asking, you know, oh, if you have a cybersecurity event, please call the FBI, you know, have law enforcement involved, report this, et cetera. Fine, that is the right thing to do because you definitely want to go that route. But if, if you were to work for company ABC, and ABC were to have knowledge in their environment of something that could potentially be a national threat, would you not want to protect that company from the consumer coming back and say, oh my God, you shared my data. No, I didn't share your data. I shared activity in the data that we're doing in our ecosystem in the sense for national security. So I think that there needs to be more cooperation to protect companies from participating. Right now, a lot of companies, when they get breached, there's, there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of shame in getting breached. They get criticized. Some of them, rightfully so, maybe there's a degree of negligence, and sometimes they're doing best efforts and they're still victimized. Because here's the bottom line. No one is bulletproof. You can spend, you can hire, you can do everything in the world, and something can still happen in an organization. However, how you respond is the most important thing. You're transparent about what happened. Do you work with law enforcement? Do you do your proper disclosures and do you protect your customers? That same philosophy needs to be applied in the, in the other direction and encouraging companies to share more, to disclose more, to be able to share threat intelligence. I happen to work, used to work for a telecom company. So you'll, you'll understand where there was that opportunity. But the reality is, is that the, at the time, the administrations would not protect the companies from potential consumer lawsuits, right? So you, you, you're interning for Home Depot, let's just imagine that Home Depot said, wow, we found something in our systems, reported it in an effort to protect our nation. And then there was a class action lawsuit by cons customers against Home Depot. How is that fair? There needs to be that layer, too, completely. Completely, completely, completely. That would be one. Yeah. You don't want to know that, uh, Jose, do you, have, do, you have a, do you have a particular thing you want the government to do for you? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> making a shopping list. I, uh, would like to defer on this question just based on the, my experience being strictly operational and, uh, Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's, yeah. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, just to echo that, it's the the question really is how do you make transparency and reporting a good business decision? And the government, like, there aren't the incentives to do that right now. And part of the part of the problem where I would like to see more be done in the halls of government is we need so much more nuance in this conversation. So much more nuance. Uh, you know, she, on the one hand, uh, with what we've seen with CISA, uh, they've made amazing strides amazing in you know and credit that to the leadership that's uh, been in there the last uh two you know um the you know they've been really good at this sort of mal malware disclosure right and that's one of the big things that in my very niche circle that i study of military and intelligence uh u.s cyber command and the nsa have done a great job of being public facing with disclosing threats to the private sector but it doesn't go the other way around. Right. right. Uh, and, and one of the big problems with nuance is uh, bureaucracy. And I know everyone likes to hammer on bureaucracy, but this is a cross organizational problem. And sort of the microcosm that the problem is summed up right now is with the current reporting legislation that's been bouncing around, uh, the fight that's happening between CISA and the Department of Justice and the FBI who want to be looped in. Uh, so it's even harder to get you know, make that a very good business decision for companies to be transparent and report when you can't even get your own house in order yeah. over what reporting looks like. Yeah, and, 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 and along those lines, not that I'm gonna hijack this one, but the, the current, um, and this, has, you know, this is more on the SEC right now that is looking for a certain degree of cyber disclosures of publicly traded companies, the spirit of what they're trying to do makes complete sense. 
how it may get executed and what those expectations will be, we have to ask ourselves, is the nuance of it being a good business decision to do, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. And now do we want to now publicize our vulnerabilities in a proxy statement that adversaries are, are going to be able to read and know exactly how to penetrate certain companies? I think not. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add it to that last piece. It does, and I don't, I'm not in government relations, but I work very closely with my person over there. <laughs> and um, it, it, we, we are definitely seeing that regulators are racing to see who can uh, require shorter and shorter disclosure times. And it becomes really confusing for, for companies. Yeah. So I think, I think consistency and clarity and simplicity would be really good to help enable that nuance. Um, the other one that I would say that I would, I, I continue to uh, harp on is overclassification. So, so much of the data that, that the government has that, they, that can get to the commercial providers where the, where, the, where the risk is, but it gets gummed up in being overclassified. I, I've, I've sat in classified briefings that uh, were no different other than the names they used than the same stuff my threat intel team has every single day. No different, but they can't tell anybody because of the classifications. And that 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 comes up the works. So we we can we can be simpler, faster, and smoother with a, a little bit more clarity. All right, let's go back here. Yeah, he was he was patient. Yeah. Sir. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, my, my, my name is Christopher uh, Brazella. Uh, I'm a student from FIU studying, uh, I, yeah, I studying like uh, IT and minoring in business, business administration. Uh, I'm also interning at the, at the US Department of Commerce focusing on, uh, on their minority business development agency. Um, so my, my question is, is that right now I'm in the position of, I'm a graduate, I'm a graduate this semester and I'm, I'm, and I'm looking for a job and I've, I've seen like every job I applied for I applied for it. They asked for like seven years, 10 years of experience. They asked for, do you must have this skill, that skill, this skill? Um, so like, I, I noticed like working in the Department of Commerce, working, working also in the private, and working also in the private sector is that those uh, companies are, are not willing to like, to like um, to train people like on the job. They're not willing to do on the job training for people. Um, so my question is like, I want to ask is like, what is like, what is your, your response uh, to this? And what advice do you have to, for me, to me, who's facing this challenge of, of, of dealing with this? We've talked a little bit about the over, over credentialing challenge. And it's unfortunate that it, that it exists. By the way, congratulations. I completely forgot the Golden Panthers were going to be in the house. <laughs> Class of 93. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, my advice to you, first of all, is not to give up, number one. Number two, you need to find inroads where you can align yourself with companies that may not necessarily be that ultimate role that you're looking for, but that may have some adjacency so that you can add to that experience, dock that over time. One of the things that I provided uh, to one of my mentees was an opportunity to do some cybersecurity observation work for a nonprofit. They basically volunteered, but guess what? After the time period that they spent there, they were able to put on their resume that they, they were side by side, shoulder to shoulder with a forensic engineer. Pretty good. And they actually got some really good exposure to it. I would say you just gotta get creative right now until we can solve, the, we can solve this mis, misconception of what a qualified candidate should be. Um, but definitely look for adjacencies. Yeah, uh, completely agreed with the point in, in finding adjacencies. I, I got lucky at the beginning of my career, uh, but I will say where I started wasn't really doing, I, I wasn't really doing much anything in the cyber realm. I got started at an insider threat company, which is technically a like domain of cyber, but it's not dealing so much with the technology. It's looking more at the people. So for our psych majors out there, right, there is a place in cyber for you. But the, the point that I'm trying to get across here is I jumped in for an internship, got some experience, uh, wasn't doing anything really cool. I wasn't doing anything super exciting, but was able to notch 
hey, I worked with XYZ databases. I've got SQL skills. I've got, uh, you know, experience briefing up to, uh, up to this level, blah, blah, blah. With that, after two and a half years there, I pivoted over to consulting. And I can tell you that my entire interview process going over to be a cybersecurity consultant had no one looked at the cyber skills on my resume. They said, cool, you have it. Tell me more about yourself and tell me about your problem solving skills and tell me how you're going to be flexible in addressing another issue. I've never done anything in inside a threat since. I jumped into identity and access management because that's where they plugged me and then from there to network security and then to their from behavioral biometrics, everything. But I picked up on the job and what they really cared about was, can you be flexible? And how good are you at problem solving? But you need to break in first by getting those adjacent skills. Just to add to that, one thing that I have found out the hard way, talk to as many people as possible particularly at the places that you want to work. I can't tell you how many cold emails I have sent in my lifetime trying to get lucky uh, and they just don't work out, but sometimes they do. And what those people can tell you is for this sort of over credential job, the question to ask if you can get a hold of anyone is, okay, what do these credentials actually mean online? Because a lot of places will post jobs and it is like magic. You're just, how am I supposed to, when they really mean something else? The other is, what does the pathway to this job look like? What are the possible ways I could come in through a side door and wind up in this job in two years or less, right? So that is that is one of the things that I've learned is just try and figure out what the internal path of a different company looks like because it's different everywhere. If you can get a hold of somebody, that information is so precious and it'll give you a leg up on how you can make your own plans into the, the position. Careers.accenture.com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a great We, we hire 27,000 people in the U.S. each year. So, like, I'm serious. Like, <laughs> go, go look at there and see, if, are there things, are there roles that look interesting to you? Because traditionally, consulting companies do build you up. Yeah. They, they take people who are more raw with less finite specific skills and build you into the professional that you want to be. It could be Deloitte. It could be PwC. There are a lot. It is absolutely a path to figure out a way to go. And there are more development programs there than in many industry jobs. So. Adding on to that, as soon as you have the consulting experience, people start reaching out to you <laughs> to come join their company instead of you applying. Okay. I think we are out of time. So we have one, one, more? More, one more question or have one more question. We have one here in the back who's been patient too. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you so much. I've been excited to ask this question. My name is Camila. I am international relations um, with a minor in international communication. And I was thinking about this, uh, where you were talking about the trust in the public and not only in consumers, but also in policymakers and everyone that's getting to know. And I wanted to ask you a lot of questions, but I think the most important is how do you think these barriers of what we can talk about and where we cannot is it's blocking the way between technology and cyber people and the communications, English majors, like that, like what's blocking it and how can we build up that bridge between, and, and that's opportunities for students like me who are more communications guided to be also part of the cyber community. In short, I think what's blocking it is just us, right? When I say us, it's ourselves. So more companies, more communities, more policy efforts needs to focus on how am I going to communicate effectively and really bring a layer of education and awareness um, to the various communities. I'm gonna mention my old employer again, Comcast. They did a phenomenal job with a program called Internet Essentials, providing connectivity to underserved communities. And while I was there, one of the things that we said was, well, let's not just do that. Let's educate these same communities on what does it mean to have good cyber hygiene? These are people that have never connected to the internet before. We gotta make sure they understand how to use it. I think it's just really a focus and a, making it a priority. And we need to translate. This is why it's so important to have diversity in the field 
we have to translate these very difficult technological concepts and bring it down to layman's terms so people can digest it and say, okay, great. You talk to me about an API and a malware event. And what does that mean? What does that mean to me? And I think that's where a, a major like yours and what you're focusing on could be extremely helpful. Myrna's team also had a marketing person because when they needed to talk to the rest of the company about what the company needed to do, yeah. they needed to communicate in a way that everybody understood. She also sat me down one time and said, what are you talking about? No one understands what you're talking about. Can you please speak just plain kitchen English? <laughs> so I remember like, that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I think like that, that is, it's absolutely a, it's a fundamental role that is coming into the cyber community 100%. Okay. If you look at the boot game on the stage, there's a lot of butt kicking going on. And we did not plan this. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank the panelists. You guys are amazing, amazing. So much wisdom and so much expertise. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Thank you. So thank you all for uh, joining us today and I'm in person and then I believe online we had about 35 people um, as well. So that's all obviously great news for us. And yes, I made a note, Myrna, I'm supposed to come back and do another discussion about something else. And um, if she can't, if we can't fly her up, we'll, we'll do that on Zoom. Um, a couple of things that I jotted down. Um, thank you again for the discussion. And also for, I think there's a lot of things that are applicable, whether you're a current student or a recent graduate about, you know, what is your why, like Simon Sinek says, right? What is your why? Really figure out what it is that you enjoy doing. And we all saw other people, friends, family, and colleagues during this pandemic that decided, oh, you know, I was doing this and I don't want to anymore, you know, or I want to go and try this, or I'm going to do a certification online for whatever. Um, we have those opportunities um, that we have now that we didn't really have before. So I encourage you to take some time to just take the time. I know we're all excited to be out and together in person, but take some time to reflect on what it is that you really enjoy doing um, and really focusing on that because things do come up based on that path. The other is um, besides the fact that they all have really cool boots up here, um, look them up on LinkedIn. Uh, so make sure you connect with them on LinkedIn. Make sure you remind them where you met them because you, you know, on LinkedIn, it's great, but after a while you're like, I don't remember and do I have that person's card and what was it? Um, and just stay connected. If you're a student or a recent alum, um, check your university alumni association, uh, wherever you are. So I'm a huge advocate. I'm a supporter of my two alma maters and I still get phone calls from colleagues, from old classmates. And I was at an event just last Friday catching up with um, other friends and students who are applying to the university. So stay connected to your alma mater. And uh, for the folks here at, who are from FIU, if you don't connect with Myrna, that's your own. I, can't, I don't know what to do about that, okay? Because I already told you. Um, and then the other is stay connected to if there's, you know, somebody, you know, on my LinkedIn page, anybody associated with Chile, by all means, reach out to us um, and let us know how we can help. Um, we will have this program available on the YouTube channel, so you can always come back to it later if something comes up and you want to pick up on that and reach out to the person um, for that. Um, a couple of things regarding partnerships. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that through this conversation that two sets of organizations and entities really look at what they're doing. One is universities. Um, Universities have a lot of power in connecting students with each other. And quite honestly, they don't do it enough. So if you're a professor, if you're part of a student club, or get the students together. And if you're a student in one club, go to another club. Tell your professor in one class, if you're in a communications class, can we do a class that's joint with the engineering class? Can we do a joint club whatever with this other club? You need to take the initiative while you're there. Um, because sometimes as professors or uh, faculty, they don't really know what you want. They kind of think they know what you want. It's kind of like in Congress, like <laughs> we vote them in and they think they know what we want, but then sometimes they go and do their own thing. Um, and they forget to check with us. They forget to check with the constituents. So sometimes you have to remind the professors and the faculty what it is that you want. 
Um, and trust me, they will listen. The other is in regards to the private partnership and public partnerships is we need more companies to actually partner with the universities and the community colleges, not just the private sector and government, but we need to be able to get that connection between the companies and the universities. I'm really dating myself because I remember friends uh, in late 80s, early 90s that had entry-level management programs at major companies. Like IBM had this massive you know, program and you would rotate like, I think they're the only one that knows is Myrna. Okay, so yeah, you know, it would be like, yeah, GE was a big one. Um, so you would work in one, you know, department for like two, three months, and then they'd send you to a different department. Where have those opportunities gone? So I'm looking at the people who are with companies, and if you're online, reconsider that, because that's a great way for the young man's question here. Uh, so I don't have all the qualifications. How am I supposed to get all of that when you don't hire me? And I don't have all those classes in school either. So if we can get back into those management training programs, I, I'm just advocating for that as well. Um, so again, thank you all. Um, please encourage you to keep the conversations going, um, connect with each other. For those of you online, thank you so much for joining us. Greatly appreciated it. Um, look forward to your engagement again via live stream or in person. For those of you who are here and want to join us, we'll have a reception for you. Um, head out the door and to your left in the Columbia foyer. I know there's several other programs, so don't cry somebody else's reception. Um, head over to the um, Columbia foyer. So for that, thank you very much and God bless. Thank you.